In this lecture, we'll discuss uh, permutation tests. We'll be focusing on randomized control trials, and we'll introduce Fisher's exact test and rank sum tests, both of which are particular types of permutation tests. And at the end, we'll discuss how to conduct permutation tests in general. Let's start with a famous story, Ready Tasting Tea, which is described in Fisher's 1935 book, His I Am Experiments. In this story, in one afternoon, a group of faculty members are gathered at the University of Cambridge in UK over, um, over cups of tea. And one lady said that tea tastes different depending on whether the tea was poured into milk or whether the milk was poured into the tea. The proper thing to do is to first pour the tea into the cup and then followed by the milk. Okay, so the lady said, I can tell the difference in terms of taste uh, if you do it in, in the wrong way. Fisher said, well, let's conduct the experiment and test whether you'll actually be able to tell the difference. Okay, so he conducted, he proposed experiment and the story goes that he conducted the following experiment. Okay, there are eight identical cups in terms of shape and color and um, everything. And there was a randomization. So run, Fisher chose randomly four cups, half of the cups, in, in, into which the tea is poured first, as, as should be done. And for the remaining four, the milk was poured first. And Fisher did, you know, Fisher did it when the lady wasn't uh, looking at it, uh, so the only he can he knows what which one is a tea first and which one is the milk first. Okay. And there was a hypothesis, which is that uh, lady cannot tell the difference. That's a null hypothesis. That's the hypothesis that you want to disprove uh, if the lady actually has the ability to tell the difference in test. And the statistics uh, they picked is the number of correctly class classified cups. And it turns out the lady classified all eight cups correctly. So she tasted each one and then she um, answered correctly which one the tea was poured first and which one the uh, milk was poured first. So she got all eight cups correctly classified. Now you might think then, oh, she must have this amazing ability to tell the difference. Um, but Fisher said, did this happen by chance? Was she just lucky and able to get it uh, correctly? So this is the origin of statistical hypothesis test in causal inference. Now let's think about how to do this um, using so-called permutation test. And you'll see why we call this permutation test um, momentarily. So there are eight cups in this table. And suppose that we had actual assignment. Uh, this is what Fisher did uh, when the lady wasn't watching. Uh, so the first cup, milk was for, poured first. Second cup, tea was poured first. Third cup, tea was, pour, uh, tea was poured first, and so on. And the lady's guess was exactly the same as the actual um, assignment. Okay, so the radius guess was exactly the same. So number of correctly, um, number of correct guess was eight. She so got them all correctly. Now let's think about the hypothetical. Since we did the randomization to assign which cup should get the milk first and which cup should get tea first, this assignment could have been different uh, if randomization led to a different uh, you know, randomization could have led to the different assignments. For example, randomization may have led to the first cup to be assigned to the uh, tea being poured first instead of the milk, and then the fourth cup could have been also tea poured first instead of milk, and so on. And if this particular um, assignment was the one that uh, was realized, so T, 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 M, 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 instead of M, T, T, M, M, T, T, M. Then, uh, under the null hypothesis that the lady doesn't, cannot tell the difference, 
she would have guessed the same way. She would have given the same answer, um, no matter what assignment it would have been, because she wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So under this hypothetical assignment scenario, she would have given the same exact answer, MTTM, MTTM, okay? So now, under the null hypothesis of the ready cannot tell the difference, we can actually compute how many uh, number of correct guesses the radii would have gotten if the assignment were different. Okay? And in this case, you can just count the ones that are highlighted by red, which is basically indicates that guess is equal to the uh, actual assignment. And in this case, uh, it's only four cups are correctly assigned, uh, correctly classified. You can consider another scenario uh, where the fourth cup is milk first instead of tea, and the seventh cup is reversed. And in this case, we can again count the number of lady would have get, given the same answer because she wouldn't be able to tell the difference, so she would have given the exact answer in this hypothetical scenario. And then we can count the number of uh, correct guesses, which is um, six. And we can do this again for another assignment pattern and count the number and, um, of correct guesses. And we can repeat this for all possible assignment patterns. Okay, so we can repeat this exercise. And it turns out in this case, there is 70 ways to do this assignment because you choose four cups out of eight cups. Okay? And each arrangement is equally likely. So if you have done this exercise, each column that I showed you in the table would have been equally likely. Okay? Now we can plot this, the number of correct guesses, after enumerating um, all possible ways. And that's this histogram. Okay? So four is most, like, um, most likely, and eight and zero are least likely. So we can do the histogram over all permutation of the assignment, the milk and tea assignments across eight cups. And the under the null hypothesis, this is the, di the distribution of number of correct guesses the radio will have given. Okay. Now we can compute the p-value. The p-value represents the probability that you observe something at least as extreme as what you observed. In this case, what you observed is eight, uh, eight correct guesses. So that's the most, excre most extreme value that test statistic can take. Okay. So we can compute that number. So that's basically the computer probability. Like what's the probability that it would happen? And since there are 70 ways to, um, to do these assignments, the one over 70 is about 1.4%. Okay. So according to the standard threshold, like 5% threshold, the p-value of 1.4% is small enough to reject the null hypothesis that lady cannot tell the difference. So this suggests that lady may have actually possessed an ability to tell the difference in terms of taste, depending on whether tea was poured into the cup first or milk was poured into the cups first. So just to summarize what we just did, is to first state the null hypothesis. In this case, the lady had no ability to tell whatsoever um, whether the milk was poured first or tea was poured first. Under that null hypothesis, we know that the lady's answer would have, wouldn't have changed even if the actual assignment were different. So we can look at the hypothetical assignments, all possible assignments, in this case, each assignment is equally likely because they're randomized, okay? and there are so many of them. And then for each assignment, we can count, count the number of correct guesses, and then plot them. And we can summarize that distribution by computing the p-value, which is the probability that we observe a value of test statistic that is at least as extreme as what we observed. In this case, that becomes 1.4% which is small enough to reject the null hypothesis. So this is an example of permutation test where the, we can 
commute uh, to an assignment based on the actual randomization procedure and then compute the uh, p-values based on um, the distribution that we observe. Now, before we go into the detail, let's briefly talk about randomized control trials. So why do we randomize gene assignment in the experiments? Well, the most important thing is that randomization makes the treatment and control groups identical other than the treatment, on average. Okay? Of course, the treatment, group, the treatment and control groups are different, uh, say, different people, different units. Okay? However, the distribution would be um, identical between those two groups. Okay? More formally, uh, we can think of it like that's that joint distribution of any observed variables, which we're going to uh, represent by x here, or um, unobserved u, or well, unobserved variable u, both are sort of pre-treatment confounders, is identical between two groups. So here I've written as conditional distribution of x and u for the treatment group, t equal 1, is equal to conditional distribution of x and u, um, for the control group, t equals zero. Okay. So the important thing is that it's both the observed and unobserved variables uh, have the identical distribution between the two, two groups. Okay. Most importantly, u, these unobserved um, variables, includes potential outcomes, y of one, y of zero. So we discussed that the potential outcomes can be thought of it as pre-treatment variables, the variables that are not affected by the treatment. Okay. So the potential outcomes of the treatment group and the control group have the same, uh, same distribution. And that's very important because it suggests that, implies that there is no selection uh, bias. The people who have, say, a high value of these potential outcomes aren't in the self-selecting themselves in the treatment group, for example. Okay. So this assumption, uh, the randomization, um, guarantees the following assumption of what we call unconfoundedness. The treatment assignment is unconfounded, uh, which basically says the treatment is statistically independent of all pre-treatment confounders, both observed and unobserved. And in particular, most importantly, the potential outcomes are independent of the treatment assignment. And that's guaranteed in the randomized experiments because the treatment is randomized. The treatment doesn't depend on any observed or unobserved variables. So this removes the selection problem in a stochastic way, in a probabilistic way, which is different from the purely controlled experiments and no randomization, where you try to make sure that the treatment group and control group are identical in many um, Characteristics. So, for example, you can try to make sure that treatment group and control group has same gender ratio, same proportion of different races, same distribution of education levels, and so on. But if you try to control uh, observed, you know, the difference in observed uh, pre-treatment com confounders, there is always po possibility that you didn't observe everything that's in, uh, relevant here, right? So, there's always omitted variables that may be making the trimming and the control group different. So therefore, randomization, what's nice about that is it makes the potential outcomes, um, makes the trimming assignment independent of all variables, both observed and unobserved, including, most importantly, potential outcomes. So we can um, attribute the difference between the trimming group and the control group uh, to the difference in the treatment assignment. The second thing that's important, especially in the context of uh, today's lecture, is that randomization enables us to formally quantify the degree of uncertainty. So in the Rady test in T example, we asked the question of, did the Rady got the answer by chance? We were able to quantify how Likely that event is by getting the ready getting the answers all correct by chance, by specifying the null hypothesis and then conducting the publication test. Right? So the p-value 
was that probability. So there was only 1.4% of chance that Rady got it um, by luck, by chance, all the uh, classification correct um, if she didn't have any ability to tell the difference in taste. Uh, so of course, there are potential problems of the randomized control trials. Uh, I'm not going to discuss it in detail here. But you can, the first thing uh, you can come across is external variety. Right? So the sample you're conducting experiment on might be very, very different from the population of interest. And uh, generalized ability, so the treatment you're giving um, might be might not be realistic, and that's not may, may not be something that actually happens in the real world. So there are external validity issues, how much you can generalize the conclusion from the experiment to the um, to the actual target population and the actual circumstance you're interested in. And also you have to worry about the certain type of human behavior if you're doing an experiment with humans. Uh, such as Hoson effect, which is the effect of you know behave, people behaving differently because they they know they're un, they're being studied, or non-compliance. So some uh, some people may not comply with the treatment assignment. So you're assigned to the treatment group, but then you may they may refuse to take the treatment, and the vice versa. If, even if you're assigned to the control group, you may end up uh, taking the treatment. Now, for the fairness and other reasons, you may not be able to deny the access to the treatment. And there could be a missing data. Um, people may not show up, they may, uh, there may be attrition, or if you're using the surveys uh, to correct the outcome variables, people may not respond to the survey. Okay? So randomized control trials aren't free of problems, but the randomization does help remove the selection problem by making the treatment assignment independent of all observed and unobserved pre-treatment variables, including, most importantly, potential outcomes. Now, the permutation test I introduced earlier is an example of randomization inference. What is randomization inference? Well, Fisher said he used randomization as the reason basis for inference. Because when we did the permutation test, the only thing we used, other than the null hypothesis, the Rady had no ability to tell the difference in the test, what we used is the randomization. We used the randomization as a way to quantify the uncertainty. In fact, all the randomness when we did the computation came from the physical act of randomization which we use to make statistical inference, compute the p-value. Okay, so the only thing we basically used is the actual act of randomization, physical act of randomization, and that's how we computed the p-value. This type of inference is also called design-based inference because randomization is a part of the experimental design. And we use that fact to do uh, statistical inference. The advantage is that we can use the experimental design to justify the analysis. We don't have to um, make other type of assumptions that are we, are we don't know whether it actually can be justified. The experimental design actually justifies the analysis we conducted. So contrast this with model-based inference, which assumes some distribution of potential outcomes. We'll, um, have an example of those uh, model-based inference as well, especially in observational studies where the design alone may not be suffice to do the statistical analysis. Okay. The advantage of a model-based inference is the flexibility. Um, 